In all recorded history, no one inspires more faith or raises more provocative questions than Jesus of Nazareth. One moment he says he came not to be served, but to serve. In another, he claims that to believe in him is to believe in God. What Jesus said about who he is and why it makes sense to doubt or believe on this day of discovery. This is the region of the Galilee in northern Israel. According to the Gospels, it was here that Jesus said things about himself that caused some to doubt his sanity and others to trust him with their very lives. Today, people from all over the world come here to the Jordan River to express in their own way their belief that Jesus was who he said he was. It shows how, how different people respond to the, to the story of Jesus told in the New Testament Gospels. Some wonder how in the world, what kind of a person would it be who would claim for himself the kinds of things that belong to God alone? Others are willing to walk into the waters of baptism and say, I'm in. Well, today we're going to hear from some men and women who have given their lives to a careful study, not only to, to the evidence for Jesus, but also to the, to the kinds of questions that linger in people's minds. From the first century until now, immersion in water has been a public declaration of personal faith. For followers of Jesus, it indicates a willingness to believe that he was far more than a good man and a wise teacher. I think people may have a hard time considering Jesus as being more than a man, first of all, because we have a hard time with considering the supernatural as being something that's viable. And, and perhaps the biggest issue they have is when they look at the deity of Jesus. Was Jesus God? Was Jesus a man? Was he a sacrifice for all of mankind? Did he exist? What did he do for us? Those are the things that are important. Because if Jesus is who he says he is, the very Son of God, God in human flesh dwelling among human beings. And he's making statements about the nature of the cosmos and the purpose of everything and who, who human beings really are and the fact that they're separated from God the Father. This has huge implications on almost everything else a person believes. I can see why they would hesitate. I would say right now the most offensive claim of Christians is that Jesus is the only way of salvation. This is characterized as intolerant, as arrogant, as narrow-minded. I mean, there's a host of vices that seem to go along with that particular claim. According to the Gospels, Jesus prompted belief in his unique and exclusive relationship with God by speaking as if even the common things of life found fullness of meaning in him. He spoke of himself as the light, as living water, the way, as the good shepherd, as the vine, the bread, and as the door and gate to God. In each case, these images had special significance for his Jewish countrymen. Imagine what people who are familiar with the 23rd Psalm that says, the Lord is my shepherd, must have thought when they heard Jesus refer to himself as the Good Shepherd. While Israel's other spiritual leaders may have thought of themselves as shepherds of the flock, pointing the way to God, the Gospel writers repeatedly quote Jesus as saying not only that he is the Good Shepherd, but that he himself is the way, the truth, and the life. Those who find Jesus' extraordinary claims hard to accept 
are in good company. According to the Gospel accounts, Jesus' own disciples struggled to believe the amazing things their teacher was saying about himself. One of uh, Jesus' uh, earliest followers, one of his original 12 disciples was Thomas, who would later be called Doubting Thomas. And as Jesus was nearing the end of his uh, earthly time with his disciples, he told them that he was going to go away and prepare a place for them. And Thomas stops him and says, where are you going? What is the way to this life that you're talking about, this house in the sky? And Jesus turns to Thomas and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So he narrows it down to who he is. And he helps Thomas to understand that all that the Old Testament hoped for, all of the, uh, the desires of the people of, of Israel to know God, to follow after him, are now resident in Jesus himself as the way, the truth, and the life. As amazing as Jesus' claim was to be the way, the truth, and the life, he made sure that his disciples didn't have to wonder whether they had misheard him. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus went on to repeatedly emphasize his unique relationship to God. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? As difficult as these words must have sounded to the Jewish followers of Jesus, they are consistent with the overall way in which the Gospel accounts tell his story. Before Jesus was born, uh, the angel announced to Joseph, his father, that Jesus will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. I don't think Joseph had any real idea of what that was going to imply later on. But Jesus, from a very early stage of his earthly life, understood what that was about. Uh, he was dedicated in the temple when he was uh, about 12 years of age. And when his parents came looking, his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, came looking for him, uh, Jesus said to him, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Uh, he understood a unique relationship that he had with his heavenly father as his son. Uh, later in his uh, adult ministry, Jesus was also in the temple uh, debating with the religious leaders. And Jesus says to those religious leaders, I and the Father are one. Now we might think that that's oneness of um, commitment, uh, oneness of mission, uh, oneness of values. but. The religious leaders understood that Jesus was claiming something for himself far beyond that because they picked up stones to stone him. They understood that Jesus was making a claim far more than just a oneness of mission. He was claiming to be one of essence with the Father. And then the, uh, the Gospel of John goes on from there and he says... As they attempt to stone him, Jesus says, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Uh, Jesus knew who he was and was very clear in declaring who he was that he was one with the Father, that he was God come to earth. One of my favorite areas of study in world religions is looking at what different traditions do with Jesus. 
Everyone knows he was here. He walked the earth. And so what do they do? How do they put him into their tradition? When you read what Jesus said and taught, a couple of things become really obvious that turn out to be a little politically incorrect. For example, Jesus was not an Eastern mystical guru. He was a Torah observant Jew. He believed there was one God and the God that he believed in was different than the creation. All right? Uh, he, he didn't believe in idolatry. He wasn't a pluralist. He said, all that came before me are thieves or robbers, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Every other tradition has to subtract something from Jesus. They either subtract his deity and say, well, he was a man. He was not really God. Or they subtract his sufficiency. Perhaps he was God, but that's not enough for forever. That's not enough for eternity. Or lastly, they may subtract his uh, uh, uniqueness and say, well, yes, he was divine, but everything is divine. We are all part of God. And that is not what he said about himself. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, one of the most prevalent claims in the world today is that all religions are ways up the same mountain or different sides of the mountain or we're all going to get there or... God's the same, but we're approaching him differently and things like that. Uh, when I hear something like that, I think about how unique Jesus is in the history of religions. There's not just one or two. It's not just, well, you've got this resurrection, but everything else is kind of normal about him. Uh, you know, he claimed to be this and that, but really Jesus isn't a bit like any of the founders of the world religions. If someone asks me what I think the biggest misperception of Jesus is in our culture, it is that he's a great religious teacher of some kind or just a prophet. Jesus does not allow you to make that conclusion about him. Jesus' claims are so great and so comprehensive that either he is the unusual person that he claims to be, the Son of God at the center of God's program, the one whom God vindicates, the one with whom everyone must deal, the one who died for sin, the one who makes life available, however you want to say it, or he's not. And that middle ground of being a prophet, of communicating some level of respect for Jesus, but not quite all that he claims to be on the one hand without dismissing him on the other, that's a place he will not let you land. This is the beautiful eastern shoreline of the Lake of Galilee. It's a lot more sand and beach here than on the west side, about seven miles across. What I was interested in is that what looked like white sand at first is actually a handful of beautifully formed tiny little shells. Water's warm this time of year. You know, it was right here in this region of the Galilee that in the days of Jesus that opinion was was radically divided over the kinds of things that he said about himself. In fact his own family felt that he was had become emotionally unstable. But others down through history have been convinced that, that Jesus was an honorable man, that he was a reasonable man. Now, they convinced themselves that the only thing that could have happened is that copyists or editors down through the ages must have put these words in Jesus' mouth. Which leaves people like us with the question, well, what, what then can we believe about Jesus? And that's why what we're hearing from these men and women today is so important, because they've weighed the evidence while being sensitive to the questions. And they've, they've given us some answers that I think are worth listening to. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is Mark chapter 2, where Jesus is teaching in a home and and some folks lower a, a paralyzed man through the roof. I mean, down he comes. It's a very dramatic scene. And Jesus looks at him, and, and the crowd is hushed, wondering what he's going to do. And Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And people look around, they're like, can he do that? You know, and, well, uh, I guess he could. Son, your sins are forgiven. But, but who in that room really knew if Jesus had the authority to forgive sins? Nobody. And Jesus knew that. But this is his character. He wanted people to know. He wanted people to know, not just wander around in blind faith. So he said, uh, uh, so that you will know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, rise and walk. And the man picks up his mat, 
the crowd clears a path to the door, and this guy walks out, maybe walking for the first time in his life, and the text says that they were astonished. Jesus wants us to know who he is and what he can do. And he's left a tremendous trail of evidence back through history testifying to these things. So we don't have to wander around in blindness and in religious doubt. Now, if I compare Jesus to founders of the major world religions only, not some small group here or there, but major world religions, Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion who said the most important thing you can consider is not just the words I'm bringing you, but what you do with me. He put himself in the place. He basically said, what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. That's an earth-shaking kind of thing. I mean, it's one thing when I tell you, I have the words to the riddle. I have the key to selling success. I can make you the greatest athlete in the world. Here's the words of life. That's something else when I say, I'm the words of life. And right away, you lock that guy up and you think, oh, he's kind of crazy. But, but Jesus had the life to kind of back that up. So first thing is, he didn't just say, I'm presenting the way, although he said that. He said he was the embodiment of truth. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. For identifying himself so closely with God, Jesus ended up being executed on charges of insurrection against Rome and for blasphemy against the God of Israel. But what that generation and everyone since has had to face is that the account of witnesses includes not only what Jesus said about himself, but also the miracles that he used to support his claims, together with his repeated insistence that he had come to die. Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion of whom miracles are reported within a generation, where we have early reports. We have reports from other major founders, but they're usually hundreds of years after the fact. Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion who said that his death was going to be very important in the scheme of things, and in, in particular, very important for our personal salvation. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. If we ask how Jesus looked at himself, nothing again tells the story better than Jesus' going to the cross. If we ask what actually got Jesus crucified, according to the Synoptic Gospels, this is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is the claim that the Jewish leadership would see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. This is a claim of being able to share God's glory and God's presence. In the context of Judaism, no one was able to share God's glory and God's presence. So it was an audacious claim. After Jesus' betrayal and arrest, just hours before his death, the high priest of Israel said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. It was either completely true, and he was who he claimed to be, or it was blasphemy. And he got crucified for it. They said, he's blaspheming. They took him on to Pilate, and Pilate executed him as one who claimed to be king. So this is, if you ask why Jesus died, it's because he claimed that he could sit at the right hand of the Father. And that's an interesting dilemma to put in front of someone, because he claimed he could sit at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion whose closest followers claimed he was raised from the dead and they saw appearances of the risen Jesus. So in all these things, he kind of stands alone. Now my question is, what happens when you put, I am the way, miracles reported by eyewitnesses, suffering, but right next to suffering, salvation from that suffering, and right next to suffering and salvation from the suffering, you've got resurrection that kind of tops it all off. And you don't just have a, a crazy event like the resurrection that arcs out of the real world. You have a life that's singularly important 
and different from all the other lives. And notice I didn't mention the ethical teachings, which is what's usually cited. You put the whole package together, and that's why Jesus is the most influential person who ever lived. Someone were to ask me why should I consider Jesus and say, in contrast to anybody else, I would say that the reason to take Jesus seriously and to take Jesus uniquely is because of his own unique claims. To remember that what Jesus is claiming about the human condition, about who I am as a person, is unlike what other religions claim, and the solution is unlike any other solution. Because of that, it's different, which means it's wrong or it's unique. I think one of the biggest shockers when people actually read the life of Jesus is they find out there's some common misconceptions. They think Jesus came simply to teach us about caring for the poor or simply loving your neighbor or simply teaching us to love. That's what Jesus was all about. But when you read the life of Jesus, these things are in there, but the moral teachings take a smaller place. Jesus actually came to talk about himself and his own role in the world. When he answers the question why he came, he says things like, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I, see, I came to give my life a ransom for many, a payment. I, uh, I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, repentance might entail loving our neighbors, certainly does, and taking care of the poor. But, but Jesus wasn't just a good moral teacher. He came to draw attention to himself and to do something on this earth that no one else could do but the person who is God visiting the planet to save mankind. That's the center. Not everyone who hears Jesus' claims automatically embrace them. In fact, some people have terrific doubts about the types of things that Jesus is claiming, especially when they become as grand as I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father or I and the Father are one or if you see God, you see me. These are not normal claims. As in the first century where there were lots of different masters in the world of Judaism and the wider Greco-Roman world, one finally had to make a determination as to which one is the right one, the good one. When Jesus came on the scene, he did not offer himself as just another option. He said, you are either with me or you are against me. Uh, it was not just one of many choices. Uh, in our day, we likewise have many, many choices of where we can place our allegiance. But Jesus calls us to himself personally and says, I'm not just um, a rabbi. I'm not just a revolutionary leader. I'm not just a great teacher, although he is all of those. Um, he makes a claim that is virtually unheard of, and that is the claim to be sent by the Father as the one way to know the Father, and made the claim that he was not just a prophet or a priest or a king, but he was Lord. He was, he was God in flesh. Uh, that's a radical claim that really deserves all of us to sit up and say, whoa, I better at least look into this. It does take a bit of faith to believe the kinds of things that Jesus said about himself. But then the men and women that we've been hearing from today believe that it, it takes a lot of faith to believe that Jesus did not say those kinds of things about himself or that he was merely a good man, an honorable man. They're convinced that those kinds of conclusions leave a lot of unanswered questions on the table. Then there's another question. It's a more personal one. Does it really make sense for any of us to make up our minds on this issue either way without reading the gospel accounts for ourselves with an open mind and weighing the evidence and then thinking carefully about the kinds of answers that, that we've heard today.